Sam, while people are trickling in, do you want to tell them about the painting? It's really nice. Yeah, it's a um, historical Chinese painting from, I guess, the late imperial period um, about uh, showing a pair of gibbons, a uh, mother and uh, father gibbon and a young gibbon forming a chain from a tree reaching down to collect water, which is something that one of the interesting kind of misconceptions that people in Eastern Asia had about gibbons. A lot of the historical information they had was accurate, but a lot of it was also inaccurate. So I guess it sort of epitomizes the kind of thing I want to be talking about is there's a wealth of data from the past about biodiversity, but how can we separate the wheat from the chaff and find relevant, valuable information rather than inaccurate information? Don't give away the punchline, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I'll keep repeating that throughout the next half <laughs> with different examples. Great. All right. So welcome to our Christmas 2020 lecture. Um, and this is going to be the last event for this year. Uh, but we all already have really good plans for the next year starting from January. Over to Sandy. Thank you very much, Padna, and good evening, everyone. It's really great to see that so, so many people have come to tonight's lecture. Welcome to, as Padma said, the Linnaean Society of London's Christmas lecture. And before we move on to the talk tonight, I'd like to just say a few things about this last year. I'm currently the president of the Linnaean Society of London. And since March, all of our events have been online. And I'd like to thank two sets of people. Firstly, our audiences who have come to the lectures, many of you have come to many of them, and you've asked super interesting questions and have in general made this year a real joy to interact with people. But most importantly, and most importantly of all, I'd like us all, all of us here, audience and me alike, to thank the wonderful dedicated staff of the Linnaean Society of London for all of their hard work maintaining and pivoting the program, the educational events, and where possible COVID safe act Access to Burlington House through this turbulent year, which has had many upheavals. Thank you all so much from me, from all of Council, and I'm sure all of our audiences at the events of all kinds. Tonight's lecture is the last of this 2020 year, which has certainly been one full of change and challenge. We're really fortunate tonight to have one of our Linnaean medal winners from 2019, Professor Sam Turvey from the Institute of Zoology at the Zoological Society of London. Sam began his professional career at Oxford and via New Zealand has worked here in London since 2004. Sam's research is focused on human impacts on biodiversity, both in the past and in the present. His book, Witness to Extinction, How We Failed to Save the Yangtze River Dolphin is an absolute must read. He's recently been doing a lot of work with endemic mammals in the Caribbean, looking at both conservation and actually doing a bit of taxonomy as well. Tonight, he'll weave together threads of his groundbreaking research in, in exploring how environmental archives such as collections and historical baselines can help conservation of biodiversity on the ground today. Sam, over to you to present your lecture, Learning from the Past, Environmental Archives and Historical Baselines. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Over to you, Thank Sam. You. Thanks so much, Sandy. And it's great to be here. Thanks so much for inviting me. And first of all, Merry Christmas, everyone. Um, I'm both a conservation biologist and a paleontologist, which might seem like a bit of an unusual combination, but hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll have a sense as to why actually that sort of slightly left field fusion of disciplines is actually really important in the current biodiversity crisis. So just as an initial overview of some shocking statistics, conservation is what we call a crisis discipline, and that's because we really are in a global crisis. Um, it's estimated that 40% of amphibians, 26% of mammals and 14% of birds are considered to be threatened with extinction. Extinction rates at a global scale are around a thousand times higher than we will typically see back in the deep time fossil record. Over the past 50 years, um, on average, global vertebrate populations have declined by 60%. And today, 96% of mammalian biomass consists of humans and their livestock. All individuals of all wild mammal species together comprise only 4% of global mammalian biodiversity biomass. So it's pretty shocking, shocking series of stats. What do we do about it? Well, for conservation, 
it's increasingly realized from drawing on things like medical um, disciplines that we really need evidence in order to make any decision to do any action. We really need robust evidence, both to guide and inform applied research in order to guide environmental management and to inform conservation policy, the three sort of tiers of what we're thinking about in terms of what conservation is. Typically, this sort of evidence consists of ecological data sets which have been gathered very recently by trained scientists studying threatened species, understanding environmental parameters, the kind of things you think about as a field biologist and what they gather. But it's increasingly realised that sometimes this isn't enough that we also need to draw on a range of non-standard data types to inform conservation. These can be things, for example, like social science data from gathering data from local communities about their knowledge, their awareness, their interactions with species, whether that's sustainable or unsustainable. But also, and what the subject of tonight's talk is going to be, is it's also increasingly realised that there's useful insight to be gained from deeper time perspectives. So data from the past as well as the present. And this is because not only are we causing extinctions today, but in fact, human activities have been associated with causing extinctions back through many centuries and many millennia. So we're currently in the late Quaternary, the final, the most recent period of geological time. We can subdivide this into two different time slices, the late Pleistocene, and the Holocene. So the late Pleistocene was the period of major climatic perturbations during ice age cycle changes from ice age conditions to modern temperate conditions from about 45,000 years until about 12,000 years ago. During this period, it's estimated 97 different mammal genera became extinct. There's a lot of debate as to what caused that, but humans are implicated in this. And following that in the Holocene epoch, the recent period of prehistory when we had basically modern day post-glacial environmental conditions, we've seen at least 250 different mammal species die out. And that's counting, these are minimum estimates because we still don't know the fossil record well enough. So back over recent millennia and tens of millennia, humans have been implicated in causing faunal change and biodiversity loss and ecosystem shifts. And further back in time, through the deep time fossil record over millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years, maybe we can also gain some useful insights from, from data from this much longer term time period as well, because we know that species have gone extinct, environments have shifted in response to different environmental conditions, to climatic changes, and to sudden unexpected catastrophes as shown by the asteroid hitting the Earth 66 million years ago, which wiped out the dinosaurs. So understanding faunal responses and faunal change to both near time and deep time changes can maybe provide useful insights for the present. So these long-term environmental archives can maybe provide unique information on past change, things like what are natural baseline biodiversity patterns of both species and ecosystems? What kind of responses does biodiversity show to past environmental change, past environmental shifts, past climatic shifts, things like that? What can we learn about the dynamics of extinction events? What actually happens when species go extinct? How long does it take? What's the spatial pattern? What are the drivers? And what kind of species are likely to be more vulnerable versus more resilient under different kinds of conditions? We might be able to learn about that from the past as well. How do ecosystems recover after extreme events? And are there ecological tipping points beyond which systems might change into something completely different? And finally, in terms of the more recent end of the past, what kind of insights can we learn about the effects, the sustainability, the unsustainability of different types of past human activities? Ultimately, we would want to try and use these different sorts of, of insights from the past to make predictive hypotheses about how biodiversity might respond to future change. So hopefully any or all of these different strands of knowledge might be of direct use for modern conservation. And it's certainly true that without a good understanding of the past, we might actually misunderstand what we think we know about fundamental aspects of ecology, biogeography and extinction risk. So we really need to understand the past, otherwise we might be misled. And I'll illustrate this with this example, a phenomenon known as shifting baseline syndrome, 
where the loss of historical knowledge is associated with a changing perception of, of what we think of as a normal environmental condition of, of syndrome, which has major implications for defining environmental management goals and restoration targets. So this um, illustration here gives you two different time slices, one from the 1960s and one from the 2000s, and it's focused on the Yangtze River in China. In the 1960s, there were still quite a few Yangtze River dolphins left in the Yangtze. By the 2000s, there were very few, if any, left. On the right, you can see two different fishermen. One of them is quite old and one of them is quite young. These are both people I've spoken to in the Yangtze. This is actually a real situation. The older chap has been fishing since the 1960s and he's still fishing today. So he, although he doesn't see dolphins anymore, he remembers a time when there were dolphins back in the 60s. So he's aware of this past environmental baseline of a river system that had dolphins in it. The younger fisherman has only been fishing since the time that there were no dolphins. So if the older members of the community don't talk about these topics to the younger members of the community, these younger fishers will have a very different baseline. They won't, not only won't know a time when there were dolphins, but they might not even know that there was a time when there were dolphins. So this erosion of historical knowledge is fundamental and it's occurring in systems all around the world at different levels of temporal resolution. So this hopefully illustrates the kind of problems you can get if you don't actually have an understanding of the past and how it's changed and why it's changed. So we have a range of different long-term archives that can be used to help us gain a better understanding of the past across different types of, of temporal resolutions. I'll cover all these in more detail um, later on in the lecture, but hopefully this gives you a snapshot of the kinds of different bits of information we might draw on. And they've been used to inform and develop a series of different related disciplines, including conservation paleontology, historical ecology, applied zooarchaeology and applied paleozoology and restoration ecology. So all of which is a bit of a, con a confusing glut of different disciplines that are trying to use evidence from the past to inform the present to guide conservation and environmental management. So don't worry too much about these different terminologies, but they're all ones that you might have heard of if you're thinking on and reading up around this broader subject. So I wanna just start off by illustrating close to home in the UK, the kinds of ways in which having an understanding of these historical baselines can actually lead to a bit of a different perspective on how we think about what we might want to do with the environment. So most of my talk is gonna be about the Holocene Epoch, that period of about 12,000 years or so since the end of the last ice age. So when environmental conditions are basically the same as they are today. So any kinds of extinctions that have happened are almost certainly attributable to past human activities rather than past climatic or environmental shifts. So for the UK, for the Holocene period, this recent slice of time, from the fossil and archaeological records, we know that there is a range of different mammal and bird species alone which used to occur in Britain but don't occur today. So for mammals, we know that we used to have elk, brown bear, aurochs, lynx and grey whales in the UK and its waters. And we used to have species such as hazel hen, eagle owl, pygmy cormorant, soft plumage petrel and dalmatian pelican. So none of these species are things you'd think of as British birds or British mammals, but they kind of all should be part of our ecosystems if it wasn't for past human activity. So that already gives a different insight as to what, what we might think of as even as being native to the UK. And understanding these past baselines, these past faunal baselines, has, has major implications for UK conservation. So I'll just give three different examples very quickly. On the top left, we have the pool frog. So this is a species which was known to occur in East Anglia, but it was thought to have been introduced a couple of centuries ago from Europe. So the population dwindled and nobody really was that bothered because they thought it's just an exotic animal which probably shouldn't be here anyway. And in the 90s, just as the pool frog population in East Anglia became extinct, people realised from archaeological sites that in fact we had pool frog bones going back thousands of years. So in fact this was a native species rather than an introduced species. And that has led to a reintroduction programme for this species in the UK. On the bottom left we've got the house sparrow, a species which has declined majorly over the last few decades in the UK for still unclear complex reasons and there's been a lot of attention about this species, a lot of funding and resources gone into understanding it. 
which is a very important thing to do to understand population declines per se. But if we look at the archaeological and recent fossil record, we see that actually the house sparrow is not native to the UK at all. It probably originated somewhere in southeastern Europe or the Middle East, and it spread across Europe a few thousand years ago as um, cultural shifts happened and horses were spread across Europe. So the kind of grain and chaff which accompanied horses in barns led to the spread of house sparrows accidentally in their wake. So it's actually not a native species to the UK or Western Europe at all which doesn't mean we shouldn't be thinking about its conservation, but it does mean we need to think about the implications and nuances of that in a bit of a different way. And on the right, the third example is the great bustard, a species which from recent historical records we know was found in Southern Britain, um, died out in the 1800s, um, and has been the focus of a multi-million pound reintroduction programme over the last decade or two to try and re-establish populations in Southern England. So we know that from one historical archive, it was here a couple of hundred years ago. However, if we look at the Holocene bone record from archaeological sites and fossil sites, there is zero evidence of great bustards being in the UK until the medieval and Tudor period, when we see a few great bustard bones turning up in banquet feasts in royal courts. So actually, it's probable that this also isn't a native species, but might have been brought over to supply Tudor dining tables and maybe establish a local population for hunting. So that's an even more nuanced perspective that one archive shows who is here, but a longer archive shows actually that's probably not a native population either. So those give a few different ways in which understanding the past at different levels of temporal resolution provide new ways to think about what we should or shouldn't maybe be setting as conservation priorities for different landscapes. Maybe the most famous way these days that the past is being talked about in terms of conservation on our doorstep is in the concept of rewilding, which isn't just about reintroducing locally extinct species, but it's more about reintroducing and restoring lost ecosystem processes, because in a sense, some species are more important than others in ecology. Some species are what we call keystone species or ecological engineers, that their presence in a landscape fundamentally changes the structure of the vegetation, the structure of the ecosystem. So reintroduction of, of large herbivores such as horses and, and wild cattle might lead to very different vegetation regimes in landscapes. And reintroductions of beavers, which have been in the news a lot over the last few years, will lead to very different flow regimes in rivers through their damming, which might be really good for um, reducing flood risk. So reintroductions of species as part of a wider rewilding mission um, is increasingly on the policy radar and increasingly in the media. It's happened in places like Nep in Sussex, Usfadas Plaza in the Netherlands, Pleistocene Park in Siberia. So it's taking off in various places and it's a very popular concept, which is increasingly taken on a variety of different meanings, depending on who's talking about it in what sense. But that's also, although it's very increasingly about connectivity to nature and restoring nature, the re and rewilding links it fundamentally to also a knowledge of what we've lost, when we lost it, why we lost it, and what happened when we lost those species to our ecosystems. So that's kind of an insight from our doorstep as to why we might want to think about the past for conservation. But actually, how much is long-term data really used in conservation? Most conservation work, be it research or management or policy, still really only uses the recent past to inform and guide what we need to do. And although there are a number of what, what are called long-term ecological studies, a recent survey suggested that only about 15% of so-called long-term studies use data sets which are over a century in duration. So long-term long still means short-term if you're thinking in terms of geology or archeology. span And in addition to that, um, the world isn't a uniform place when it comes to conservation. The examples I've given so far have been very much on our doorstep in the UK or Western Europe. But um, actually, maybe this isn't really the landscape we need to be thinking of when we're thinking about conservation priorities. So this is a map about global mammalian extinction risk, with the increasingly red bits of the map being areas where we have more and more threatened species. 
as you can see, the UK and Northwest Europe are pretty white and cold on this map. There's not much here that's in a global sense threatened with extinction. Whereas if we look at some other parts of the world, notably Eastern and Southeast Asia, we see that actually those areas are far more global hotspots for really tackling conservation issues and global scale biodiversity loss. So maybe we should be thinking about these areas rather than our doorstep when it comes to how much we can infer um, information from the past to guide conservation. But then we meet the question, which of these global priority regions actually have the kind of environmental archives we would want to use in order to try and integrate data from the past to guide these different aspects of what we think of as conservation? So this is a major issue. So for the rest of my talk, I want to really focus on one geographical region, which is fascinating and unique and where I've worked for much of my career for over the past 20 years. Um, and that is China, because this is a global priority region for biodiversity conservation, but which has a uniquely detailed set of environmental archives spanning different types of temporal resolution and different types of information. So I want to explore the different ways in which it might be possible to integrate data from the past to inform conservation in China. So China's got a wide range of ecosystems from sea level up to the top of the tallest mountain in the world, from boreal tundra and tiger forest down to subtropical rainforest, deserts, grasslands, pretty much every ecosystem you would want. And it's what we call a mega biodiverse country. It has over 10% of the world's mammal species, for example. So from famous animals such as giant pandas and elephants through to more obscure animals like golden monkeys, clouded leopards, tarquins, pangolins, a, a range, a wealth of biodiversity across a range and a wealth of different ecosystems. But it's also experiencing major environmental pressure huge human population densities have led to huge amounts of the landscape being converted for intensive agriculture and intensive urbanization and intensive pollution and there's coupled to that intensive pressure on remaining wild animal populations both for food and for things like traditional medicine so here is a series of of wild animal antlers and horns for sale outside a chinese temple that i photographed and here are some pangolin fetuses being served in rice wine as a medicinal tonic on the southern Chinese border. So all kinds of pleasant and less pleasant pressures on Chinese biodiversity happening across the board. And we've seen catastrophic loss of Chinese biodiversity in recent years. This is the Yangtze River dolphin or Baiji, the species I mentioned earlier in the example about shifting baseline syndrome that I gave. Um, this um, the population collapsed catastrophically in the end of the 20th century and I was involved in the last ditch attempts to try and conserve the species but unfortunately in 2006 we found that the Yangtze River dolphin was extinct, the first large vertebrate to become extinct uh, in 50 years and the first to have disappeared since the establishment of a global conservation community, so an absolute global tragedy. So the Baiji is gone, other species in China still survive, but only in ex situ zoo populations rather than in self sustaining wild populations. This is the Pear David's deer or the Milu, which um, died out sometime in the past. I will come on to this later in the talk, but by the time it was discovered by Europeans, it was only found in a single um, hunting lodge near Beijing. And all of the animals today are descendants of this captive herd from the end of the imperial era. Other species still survive in the wild, but are critically endangered. This is the Hainan gibbon, which is a species I've worked on for a long time. Um, it's unjustifiably not very well known, but it's actually contender for the world's rarest mammal. There's a population of maybe about 30 individuals left in a single patch of rainforest in a single national park on Hainan Island, which is China's southernmost province. It's the island off the south of China, south of Guangdong. So this is obviously about as imperiled as you can get for a wild animal species. So China has many problematic conservation major issues like this. 
So there are a lot of recent environmental baselines. This is Hainan Island showing the loss of forest, the loss of green over the last few decades. You can see that forest loss is ongoing in this region, but also it has a very long history of human, human pressures on the environment going back for millennia. Um, anatomically modern humans have been present in China for maybe a hundred thousand years or so, depending on, depending on what you count as an anatomically modern human from the fossil record. But certainly when we come to the Holocene, the time period I'm talking about, we've had very, very large human populations in China compared to pretty much anywhere else in the world. So already by one and a half thousand years ago, cities such as Nanjing had well over a million inhabitants. It was already over a millennium ago, the most populous part of the world. And William Ruddiman, um, the paleoclimatologist, has suggested that actually these Holocene prehistoric um, pressures on the environment in China actually had global impacts several thousand years ago. He suggested that global levels of CO2 started to rise 8,000 years ago, and global levels of methane, another greenhouse gas, started to rise 5,000 years ago as a result of prehistoric rice agriculture spreading so far across China. So not only did China definitely have local impacts due to this very large population growth a long time ago, but also possibly they, they had global impacts long before the current um, climate crisis that we're experiencing. It might have had a, a much earlier tail starting from these activities going on in China several millennia ago. So luckily, as I said, we've got various different environmental archives that we can look at to try to understand what's happened in China in the past across different resolutions. So starting from the most recent and working further back in time, the most recent of these are things like local ecological knowledge and traditional knowledge possessed by rural and indigenous communities who live close to remaining areas of natural forest and natural landscapes in China. So both Han people and various different ethnic minority groups across China who still interact with remaining biodiversity and who culturally might well have traditions and knowledge about biodiversity not only in the present but also in the past. So I've done a lot of work with engaging and talking to different ethnic groups and communities across China try to understand what they know not only about species today but about species and biodiversity change in the recent past. Further back in time, we have um, European and colonial historical records. Um, for example, this is from uh, a, a hunting party from about 100 years ago, from going out from Shanghai to bag a load of water deer, which would have ended up in restaurants in Shanghai and elsewhere in, in southeast China. And an image of two leopards shot on the campus of Fujian Christian University after an exciting chase. You certainly won't see leopards on the campus of Fujian University anymore. So these century old archives provide a very different flavor of what kind of animals people interacted with in China just a hundred years ago. But of course, in addition to the European historical archive for China, China has an extremely rich, probably the world's most rich historical archive of its own, a record spanning over 2000 years much of which um, includes aspects of natural history which might be of interest for us to understand conservation. So some species such as gibbons were really important in ancient China. So their long arms were thought to channel qi energy to allow them to live for 700 years. And gibbons are also represented in classical poetry. They represent the melancholy of travelers far from home. So travelers in places like the Three Gorges would write poetry about gibbons a thousand years ago or more in places where we know gibbons no longer occur. So these different kind of cultural reasons led to various species being recorded in Chinese archives. And in addition to these sort of poetic and cultural factors, there are more prosaic functional reasons why local gazetteers, local dignitaries would often record the species that were important culturally and economically in their local landscape and record what was there so to, as part of the kind of wider taxation, wider inventorying of local resources for, for governmental management. So we have all these different sorts of archives as to what used to be around in China. Um, going further back, we have archeological data, both the bone record that of from sites that were accumulated by human hunters in the past, and also other artifacts such as this ceramic elephant, sadly missing its trunk and front end, from the Hamudu site in the Yangtze Delta from about 8,000 years ago, which again shows us that there were elephants in this region then. And even further back in time, 
we have the recent fossil record. So China has an extremely rich Pleistocene to Holocene fossil record as well, partly because of this. This is my favorite figure from any uh, scientific paper ever. It shows what was happening throughout the Pleistocene and Holocene in China. Basically, pandas seem to enjoy falling down holes and turning into fossils. And because of this fantastic behavioral quirk that pandas appear to have had, according to this paper, we have a very, very rich fossil record of things like pandas for China. So we can look at all these different sorts of environmental archives, these long-term archives, and work out what can we tell for China? What does that tell us about the past and what can that tell us for conservation today? So I want to just go through a few different areas of knowledge in which I think these environmental archives can tell us something new that we might want to take on board when we're thinking about conservation in China. So at the most basic level, we can use these archives to reconstruct past biodiversity baselines. For example, there are various different bones of animals found across recent fossil and archaeological sites across China, which don't occur in those landscapes today. And they can tell you quite different things, actually. So I want to give a couple of different examples. So this, these are antlers and antler cores of a type of deer called a muntjac, but it's a very large muntjac, <clears throat> and it was described as a new species, Muntiacus gigas in 1990, from archaeological sites in the Yangtze Delta and along the Yangtze River. So it's thought to be a unique species to this region, which had then died out sometime in the last few thousand years. So it must be an endemic, local endemic species, which has been lost globally from China. But actually, since those archaeological remains were found, giant munchaks are found living further down in Southeast Asia in the Annamite Mountains of Vietnam and Laos. And as far as you can tell from comparing statistically the antlers between the extinct, the extinct population and these living animals, there's no difference between them. So it would appear that actually this supposedly extinct species <clears throat> from central China is actually an extinct population of a giant muntjac which still survives further south in Southeast Asia. So actually what we're seeing here is a massive range contraction species, a single species which has died out in part of its range and survived in other parts of its range, presumably because of spatial variation in past human pressures between China and the mountains of Southeast Asia. And we see a similar pattern for other species as well. So these are the Sumatran and Javan rhinos, two of the rarest large mammals in the world. And they survive today just as a few very isolated threatened populations on peninsula and island Southeast Asia in Sumatra and Java. But historically and prehistorically in the Holocene, they occurred far more widely across continental Southeast Asia and into China. The peach color on these maps is the historical distribution, but actually prehistorically into the Holocene, we know they were across much of southern and eastern China. So we see this common pattern of species surviving elsewhere, but having been wiped out from China during the past few thousand years. And in fact, southern and eastern China would probably have looked much like this, nothing like the skyscrapers of Shanghai or Wuhan, but actually fertile deltas, fertile river floodplains with riparian forests and diverse megafauna. So a very different landscape from looking at these snapshots of the past from archaeological sites. But in fact, it's not just range contractions we're seeing, but actual species extinctions as well. So this is the skull of a gibbon that was found in the tomb of the grandmother of the first emperor of China, Qin Shi Huang, the emperor who made the terracotta warriors, the terracotta army, and who commissioned the Great Wall to be built. So the founder of China a couple of thousand years ago, the founder of what we think of as, as politically as China today. And so he himself might actually have seen this individual gibbon, which was buried as a royal tribute trophy in the tomb of his grandmother. So if, first of all, just on that ground alone, it's a fascinating artifact to have been able to study. But when we did morphometric work on it, comparing the measurements of the skull and the teeth of this, of this gibbon specimen to um, samples of all living gibbon species today, we found that the red dots on each of these morphometric plots fall outside the variation we see in any living gibbon species. So in fact, this individual gibbon, this royal trophy from a historically hugely important site in Shanxi province, 
is not only a new species of gibbon, but also a new genus of gibbon, um, which has become globally extinct. Although this specimen is a couple of thousand years old, we know from historical records that gibbons survived in that region until the 18th century. So we're seeing not just range contractions, but also species extinctions. And this is hugely important. It's the first known Holocene post-glacial extinction of a primate species anywhere in the world. And also it's quite likely that other gibbon populations elsewhere across China might also have been similarly different. Um, we don't have as good skeletal material, so we can't tell, but it's likely this might be the tip of the iceberg. So from the, even this basic baseline understanding of past diversity, we can see these different patterns manifesting, which show us patterns of, 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 of what we might, of, of different insights into biodiversity loss and how we might want to treat modern day biodiversity. But we can go much further as well. So the second area I want to talk about is, is understanding extinction dynamics by which I mean not just knowing what was there in the past and what's now gone, but how did these populations go? What was the pattern across space and across time? And what can that tell us maybe for conservation today? So for this, I want to stay with the subject of gibbons. So gibbons today are restricted to the corner of southwestern China in the three provinces of Yunnan, Guangxi and Hainan. But from, the, from China's really fantastic rich historical archives, in particular these gazetteers, these government documents, which reported what kind of wildlife occurred in local environments in past centuries, we can find a huge number of different historical gibbon records, all these red dots across a vast area of China going back just a few hundred years. And in fact, we've got gibbon records from 160 different municipalities in 19 provinces. So although they're in the very small corner of southwestern China today, they had until recently a huge distribution across China. So what we can do is we can look at these records of gibbons, because each of these records has got a location and a date. And we can see how that changes over time. So if you look at this bar plot, the initial bar on the left is just the total number of records at all. But after that, it's broken down into 50 year time bins from 1600 AD onwards. And you can see that the number of different, different sites for which gibbons are recorded drops off over time. And statistically, there's a a change in the rate at which these gibbon populations vanish between about 1850 and 1900, the slope of that decline shifts, which is really interesting because it matches very nicely what we know was happening in China. So we can bore down into it and see what's actually going on. So that's the initial distribution of gibbons. And over time, we see these populations decreasing, fragmenting, declining, until by 2000, they've almost all gone. And we see this sort of southwestern range contraction of, of preferential loss from the east and the north and survival in the southwest. And this matches what we know about historical increase in population density in China around 1850, 1900, we saw this exponential increase in human population in China. And that's coupled with known massive increasing um, destruction of local environments. So this is a postage stamp issued during the Great Leap Forward in 1958, a period when about 10% of China's remaining forests were cut down in a month. And it's the only postage stamp I know of which actually celebrates destruction of forests. So there was huge amount of population growth and huge amount of environmental destruction going on in this period when we see that escalation of, of decline of gibbon populations and their persistence in the furthest remotest southwestern corner of the country. So this in itself is really interesting, but it also allows us to understand something a bit more fundamental about conservation biology, because today we've got lots and lots of, unfortunately, lots and lots of threatened species, but all we have is a snapshot of how they're doing now. We don't know the trajectory that brought them to that point, that perilous point they're at today. And actually understanding the pattern of how populations decline towards extinction is really vital to understand what processes might be driving it and what processes we should be trying to, to mitigate. And so there's been these two different models of in conservation biology as to how species decline towards extinction. We've had the demographic hypothesis and the contagion hypothesis. So the demographic hypothesis suggests that as species decline, their ranges contract inwards, and so species will last for the longest in the geographical center of their distribution. 
because presumably that's the bit of their range which has got the best conditions for them environmentally. The contagion hypothesis, however, suggests that any kind of demographic parameters are totally swamped by external threats. So no matter if habitat quality is good or bad, species might be totally overwhelmed by a pressure that's coming in, be it human population growth or something like that, increased environmental destruction, which can sweep in from a particular direction of the range and kind of sweep across like a wipe across their whole range meaning that they're less likely to survive in the middle, the core of their distribution, but actually they're most likely to survive on the margins, on the very edges geographically of where they were once found. And so these two totally conflicting, contrasting models give very different implications as to whether species are likely to survive in good quality habitat or not, and therefore what that means about managing these tiny threatened populations. So we see from this Gibbon example, and also from the Munchak example, also from the sort of March and Javan Rhino example, that the contagion hypothesis is what we're, what is how these populations have declined spatially. And it's associated with what we know historically about a southward demographic expansion of human population in China during the late imperial Republican and communist eras. So in fact, this means that probably in China, populations are hanging out at the edge of their range, which might not be the best quality habitat. It might be marginal, um, suboptimal habitat, but it's just an area where these species haven't been totally overwhelmed by human pressures, which have been uneven in their impact across space. And that matches another component of what we see from the Gibbon data, that all of the Gibbon populations we've got left in China are stuck up on mountains. But we know from historical records that they were also, until a few hundred years ago, found in lowland landscapes as well. And this matches what we see for many other threatened species as well, most famously in China and probably internationally the giant panda, which is up in mountains in Sichuan and Gansu and Shanxi province, but also other species such as Kakapo and Takahe in New Zealand. The last wild populations of these birds were last found up in high remote mountains. And this has led some people in the past to think, well, these species must be adapted for mountain conditions. But actually, from what we see from the gibbons, what we see from archeological and fossil records for pandas in China, these species were actually historically and prehistorically found in lowland environments as well. And the reason they've survived in mountains might not mean that mountains are actually any good for them. They might just be hanging on in very bad quality habitat. But it means that these habitats are places where humans haven't really destroyed their environment and hunted them as much as they have in more accessible lowland uh, environments which are easier to convert to agriculture. So it gives quite a fundamental insight into places where we find these threatened species today might not actually be very good for those species, they might be just hanging on, but we can learn from these historical baselines that actually the wider environmental tolerances, the wider patterns of habitat suitability that we might then want to take into consideration when we're thinking about how to manage and conserve these last given populations, the last panda populations, the last Take population. And of course, my PowerPoint has crashed. I was expecting that to happen sooner. So bear with me and pour yourself a glass of mulled wine while I try and reboot my talk. I will just sip my coffee. Well done, Sam, at cleaning up your desktop. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. It's here, here, Sam. So, OK, we'll take two. So the third area of information I wanted to talk about for China is the complementarity of long term archives. So up to now, I've just been talking about single source of information, be it what we can learn from historical records or what we can learn from the fossil or archaeological record. But maybe if we draw multiple records together, we can get a wider, more synthetic understanding of the past, which might tell us even more for conservation. So for this part of the talk, I want to think about Hainan Island, the place in southern China where we have that last remaining Hainan gibbon population of the world's rarest mammal. So Hainan is, has what we call a depauperate mammal fauna. It's got far fewer species than we see today or recently in history for neighbouring parts of China or mainland Southeast Asia, Vietnam or Laos. Um, but also it's a closed system for investigating extinction dynamics. It's, it's kind of 
hermetically sealed by the sea, you can actually maybe explore what's going on in a bit more simple processes rather than the more complex processes that might be taking place on the mainland. So I want to look at multiple different environmental archives to see was Hainan's fauna different in the past in the Holocene? And if it was different, what's happened between the past and the present and why? So there's various different archives I want to draw on here. So we've got the recent fossil record, the historical collections, historical art written archives from China, and oral traditions of local communities. So Hainan is an island today, but it's a continental shelf island, which means that during the last ice age, it was connected to mainland Asia. And it was isolated from the mainland by rising sea levels in the early Holocene. And luckily we've got a really good fossil site from a cave in southern, China, uh, in southern Hainan called Luobidong, which dates to pretty much the time that Hainan became isolated. It's got a diverse mammal assemblage and it contains several mammal species which are characteristic of Southeast Asia but which aren't found in Hainan today and aren't recorded from Hainan historically. So these include mega herbivores like buffaloes and elephants and tapirs and also the largest regional carnivores, tigers. So this is a tiger mandible from a cave in Hainan. So we know that although we don't have these animals today in Hainan and we don't have any record of them historically. We know that originally when Hainan became an island, the, the, the standard complement of the kind of animals we think of as occurring in Southeast Asia were also found in Hainan. Moving forward in time, over the past couple of hundred years, especially in the 19th century, outside collectors were able to visit Hainan and, and collected a few specimens which ended up in international museum collections. And this is a photo of a couple of deer skins that were collected by um, Swinho in the 1860s in Hainan. And for a long time it wasn't clear what kind of animal, what kind of deer they were. They were thought to be Eld's deer, which is a species which is still found on Hainan today but some questions are raised about them. So a couple of years ago, we were able to conduct some ancient DNA analysis to work out what species of deer these actually were. And it turns out that they were actually Pear David's deer. The animals which I mentioned earlier were found in the Imperial Hunting Lodge outside Beijing in 1900, but no one has ever been clear where they came from in the wild. So it appears that these deer skins in a drawer in the Natural History Museum are the only known wild individuals of Pear David's deer known anywhere in the world. And it appears that this species, now surviving in captivity, totally extinct in the wild, survived longest in Hainan until at least the 1860s. So it's another example of probable survival at the edge of its range. We know from the fossil record it was on mainland China. We didn't actually know it was on Hainan at all. So this provides a new piece of the jigsaw. Moving, sort of staying about the same place in time, but using a different archive. Hainan has a 400 year gazetteer record comprising 38 volumes of, of various different natural history observations going back to the 16th century. In this archive, uh, two different large mammal species are recorded which aren't present on Hainan today, the wolf and the dole, a type of wild dog which I'll come to talk about more in a moment. And these are represented by various different records from dating from various different times. And if you do statistical analysis on the dates of these species, we can work, we can estimate when they're likely to have gone extinct. So based on the dates of different records of wolf, the dates of different records of dole, both of these species are likely to have vanished from Hainan in the 1940s or 1950s. And the fourth type of data that we can maybe draw on to understand past biodiversity change in Hainan is, these, is this indigenous knowledge, these, these oral traditions, oral testimonies of local people, local communities living in close proximity to the last remaining forests on Hainan. So a few years ago, I did a large scale interview survey in communities um, around seven different forest protected areas, interviewing about 700 different people. And in particular, we asked them about seven different mammal species, which are supposed to occur in Hainan. And these were wild boar, rhesus macaque, Hainan gibbon, black bear, clouded leopard, sambar deer, and pangolin. And so this plot here shows, it, it shows the slope of 
people's sightings, by which I mean, we asked people when's the last time they saw or had heard of anyone seeing these different animals. And the more recently they had seen them, the higher the slope, the higher it is to the present. So you can see that a couple of these species, wild boar and macaque, have got quite high slopes, that they have been seen quite recently by a lot of people. And the third most recently seen species is the Hainan gibbon. Bear in mind, this is the world's rarest mammal. So four of the species we talked about, for which we don't have good evidence of their continued survival in Hainan, the bear, the leopard, sambar and pangolin, have on average been seen by people further back in time than anyone has seen or encountered a gibbon. So if there are any of these four species left, populations of them left on Hainan, they must be incredibly close to extinction, if not already gone. So by comparison with what we know about the Hainan gibbon as a baseline, we can infer the relative likelihood of the disappearance of wild populations of these four mammals very recently. They've still been seen by people, they're known about from people's living memories and personal experiences, but they've, if not gone, they're very close to going. So if we combine these four different sources of data into a single sort of coherent uh, complement, we can see, we can get a, a greater understanding of what's happened to Hainan through time. So on this plot, the early Holocene, prehistory is on the right and the present day is on the left. We have the mega herbivores and the mega carnivores lasting into the Holocene, but vanishing relatively early. We have Pear David's deer lasting a bit longer, wolves lasting a bit longer still, clouded leopards lasting maybe up to the present, but maybe extinct, and gibbons persisting to the present, but for how much longer, we don't know. And these different sources, these different insights into extinction chronologies are gained through combining data from fossils, ancient DNA, historical archives going back centuries, and people's oral traditions, especially old community members. So this combining these different archives allows us to determine the pattern of past extinctions in Hainan through time. And we, what we see is this progressive depletion stretching back from prehistory to the present, possibly into the future, hopefully not. But what we really see here is it's not a single recent event. It's a protracted progression of extinction over time, probably across much of the Holocene. And we can identify that these extinctions are almost certainly all caused by humans because all of them have taken place in the period of current day environmental climatic stability, i.e. after the end of the last ice age, we know that all of these species were present into modern day environmental conditions. Um, and this overview of faunal dynamics is only really possible from this synthesis of different archives at different timescales, different temporal scales. And it raises a lot of important questions for conservation. Why has Hainan's mammal fauna been so vulnerable to extinction? Why has it lost more species compared to neighboring parts of China and Southeast Asia? And why has it lost them longer ago? Because we know that forest cover was fairly intact across the whole island until the 20th century. So what went wrong for this fauna earlier on? It's a really important question to tackle in order to be able to work out how best to conserve its surviving biodiversity. The gibbons are highly threatened today, but how did they survive so long compared to all these other losses that happened earlier? And what does it all suggest about the future of Hainan's biodiversity? So if we think about all these archives together, it gives, it raises these really important questions which we might not think about if we just look at the current day snapshot of what we see on Hainan today. So, those different sort of ways of looking at the past all provide a very sort of glass half full picture. They all suggest there's lots of insights we can get. But of course, inevitably in science and conservation, it's not as simple as that. So the last bit of the talk I want to touch on is actually how far can we interpret all of this? What are the issues about both data quantity and data quality? And is the past a foreign country for actually understanding conservation? So first of all, just staying with this um, series of different archives for Hainan, they can give us a lot of unique insights which we can't get for conservation from any other resource, but they're definitely not perfect themselves. So we were able to get a lot of data from talking to old community members about species which didn't seem to still survive, but which they had encountered themselves during their lifetimes. <clears throat> 
things like the clouded leopard, the pangolin, the sambardia. But we also asked, do you know about any species that used to occur here but have died out, species which your parents, your grandparents might have talked about, so which you haven't seen yourselves, but which there's a tradition in your community's knowledge about having occurred, about past environmental baselines before your own living experience. And basically no one could tell us anything. A couple of people suggested maybe there'd been tigers, maybe there'd been a kind of deer that used to be here that died out in my parents' time. But effectively nobody had anything useful in terms of conservation management to tell us about extinctions which had happened before living memory. So this is very useful to know that at least for this social ecological system in for these communities these ethnic groups there doesn't seem to be any tradition of knowing about of recalling past biodiversity before their own lifetimes um, the historical archives the gazetteer archives for hainan were hugely useful in some ways for telling us about wolves and dole but also were very confusing because they were compiled not by scientists but by local officials local mandarins who didn't have a grounding in natural history or biology or zoology and so there was this bewildering diversity of different types of animals some of which you could correspond to modern species concepts but many of which it was impossible to say what they were and we know that there's only supposed to have ever been one type of bear on Hainan, but there were five different types or names of bears given, 13 different types or names of deer given. Are these really all the same thing? Are they multiple types of bear that we don't know about? It's just confusing. So there's huge insights to get from these archives, but also huge complexity, which might be impossible to unpick. We were able to understand the past occurrence of Per David's deer on Hainan through the use of ancient DNA analysis. And this was possible from historical specimens collected one or 200 years ago, but older specimens from tropical environments are really likely to have problems with extracting DNA because under those kind of tropical, warm, humid conditions, we, we typically expect to see rapid degradation of DNA molecules. So although we can probably get DNA if we're lucky out of historical skins from museums, archeological bones or fossil bones, even if they're only a few thousand years ago, from landscapes like Hainan or elsewhere in Southern China or other parts of the tropics, which are conservation hotspots, we may be, it may be impossible to get ancient DNA to actually guide species identification. And although I, we were really lucky to have a single fossil site with a rich fossil fauna from Hainan, which can act as a fossil baseline for what used to be there, the site which told us that there had been elephants and tigers and species like that, it only contains th about 30% of the species we know are still on Hainan today. So it's clearly missing a very large proportion of the of the overall original fauna that was present in Hainan at the time that those fossils were deposited. So again, it's a tantalizing incomplete insight. It's a glimpse into what was there in the past rather than the full complement of the, a, a, a full baseline of what was there. So all of these different archives give us glimpses. They give us glimmers. It's like looking through a glass darkly. We can see some aspects of the past, but we can't use any of them either on their own or even together to understand the full complement of what has happened, what we used to be there in the past and what's changed and when. So it's a unique source of data telling us something totally novel, but also very, very incomplete. And ultimately, almost none of the extinct species, the wolves, the dolls, the elephants, the Pear David's deer, the clouded leopards, almost none of them are recorded in more than one of these long-term archives. So the gazetteer record doesn't record Pear David's deer very well, doesn't really record clouded leopards, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So we've got to combine all of these archives together to get these more and more insights. And that's another indication that each of these archives, whilst providing unique insights, is also really, really incomplete, which is tantalizing and frustrating. So that's an indication of the issues of data quality. But also the last thing I really want to talk about then is even if we had good quality data, it's possible there's actually differences between past and present, which further complicate our attempts to use the past to guide present day conservation. They don't make it impossible, but they mean we've got to think about things a lot more carefully. <clears throat> 
So I just want to talk briefly about a project I was involved with a few years ago, which tried to pull together data from a range of different archival sources to understand extinction patterns in mammals across China through time. So we gathered together data from Holocene, archaeological and fossil sites on the top left, 255 different sites, which included wild mammal remains. Then we gathered together four and a half thousand historical records from different sites, which from dating from about 1900 to 2000, so over the last century or so, which again showed different locations for different wild mammal species. And we combined these different ancient and recent archival records of species with current day snapshots of where different mammal species still occur today in China. So I'll illustrate what I mean by the dole, the, the, the wild dog, which I mentioned had died out in Hainan. This is a map of mainland China. And the dark gray shows the estimated range of wild dogs in China today based on the IUCN range map. So you can see that quite a lot of these fossil, archaeological and historical sites fall within the dark grey. So they're from, they're from landscapes where we know dole still occur, or at least occurred until really recently in China. However, some of these points actually fall outside the current distribution of dole. So the medium grey over in the, the east of China and in a couple of other places show how we've expanded the range of dole to for a, a 1900 AD distribution, at least we can tell that based on these historical records of Dole outside its current distribution, we can expand its geographic distribution out a bit further. And then the paler grey range extension shows a further extension based on these older archaeological and fossil records to give a kind of combined current plus past century plus recent prehistory distribution to build these ranges out further and further to know at the very least we can infer that those are where dole might have occurred a few thousand years ago in China. So we, we built up these composite range maps for a, a lot of different Chinese species which allowed us to compare through time snapshots of what's happened to China's mammal fauna over time. And so if you think about it in terms of these two time slices, we've got on the left um, images of from the Holocene up to around 100 years ago, and then on the right, 1900 AD up to today. So I'll talk you through what these plots show. At the top, we've got extinction heat maps showing um, increasing red cells show cells which have lost an, in an increasingly large number of mammal species from our data set. Um, and you can see that up to, in that time period, uh, over the past few thousand years, up to a century or so ago, mammal extinctions are really clustered in China in the sort of east and central part of the country, and there are relatively few extinctions anywhere else. Whereas over the past century, that pattern changes totally. You've pretty much got extinctions happening everywhere across the country. At the bottom, we've got plots of the relationship between body mass and the amount of a species range that's been lost in each of these time slices. So from the Holocene up to around a century ago, um, the bottom left plot shows that there's a really nice correlation, which is nice, nicely statistically demonstrated by nice p-values and everything, of as you get bigger, if you're a mammal, you're likely to have lost more of your range. So larger animals, declined more in China until about a century ago. So this is the period when things like the elephants and the rhinos declined spectacularly, the giant muntjacs, all of those declined, whereas smaller bodied species tended to not decline that much. And that pattern again changes in the last century. Instead of a nice linear relationship between the larger you are, the more you decline. In fact, it's more of what we call a field of bullets scenario. Pretty much everything declines, irrespective of whether you're large or small. So not only are extinctions now happening across the whole of China, but whatever kind of animal you are, you're declining. There's no relationship with body mass anymore. So in both of these kind of measures of extinction pattern, we see very different patterns as we go through most of the Holocene compared to the last hundred years or so in China. So there's two possible explanations for this. Um, one of them is what we call an extinction filter. It could be that exactly the same processes have been going on through time, but 
um, by the time that we get to the 20th century, large herbivores have already kind of declined as much as they can do. They've done all their declining already in previous centuries. There's kind of no more range left to be lost because they're already so rare by the time you get to 1900 AD. And maybe these high elevation refugia, these kind of species stuck on mountain tops, like the gibbons, like the pandas, that might have been much more common in the past, but just progressively through progressive attrition, the same process is just accumulating over time that most of those mountain refugia have also gone. There might have been gibbons on every mountain in China. By the time you get to 100 years ago, most of those have vanished. So this extinction filter might mean that the same thing just happening over time again and again has led to these disappearances. Or it could be something more interesting, but more confusing and more complicating, is maybe there have actually been different processes happening between past and present. We certainly know that there's been a quantitative difference in human pressure in China in the last 100 years or so. There's been a massive increase in human population density, a massive increase in deforestation, as we saw from the given examples I gave earlier. And we also know there's been a geographic change in these pressures. So, for example, human population growth and human habitat conversion has only really happened on the Tibetan plateau over the last century or less. There wasn't really that kind of human demographic pressure on a lot of China's environments. It was instead concentrated more in the Yellow River Plain, the Yangtze River Plain in eastern and southern China until relatively recently. And maybe most interestingly of all, there's been a qualitative difference in human pressure. So not just an increase in this pressure, but a change in the nature of this pressure. And um, by which I mean that in the 20th century, during the, the civil war, the change from the Republican era into the communist era, there have been what are called ideological wars on nature. So when the communists took over in the late 40s and 50s, they had one of the campaigns was called Kill Tiger, Banish Evil, because Chiang Kai-shek and the Republican era was seen as being like a tiger. And so peasants were encouraged to kill as many wild tigers as they could, because it was thought to stand symbolically for the Republican era that had been overthrown. So for political reasons, biodiversity was targeted and destroyed, which presumably is totally different to the kind of reasons biodiversity was affected and impacted in previous centuries and millennia in China. And so this is just an example of the kind of politically driven environmental campaigns we see in China in the 20th century. On the right, we see a poster for the famous War on Sparrows, which also took place in the 50s, where everyone was encouraged to kill as many songbirds as possible for, to try and protect crops. So again, this kind of pressure on the environment, these kind of onslaughts at a nationwide level are qualitatively different to anything we've seen before. So seeing these differences between past and present. So not only are there data issues, we actually don't have enough data to understand the past properly, but also sometimes the data we have suggests that there are these qualitative differences between what we see in the past and what we see in recent history in the present. So <laughs> these differences in extinction dynamics through time have implications for how we can use long-term baselines to inform management. It's certainly not impossible, but it means we've got to have much more caution and much more context about each of these situations. It's not a one size fits all. We can't just apply the past willy nilly. We need to think about the specific situation, the specific landscape, the specific question, the specific issues we're dealing with and work out what might be appropriate and what might not be appropriate to bring to the table from the past. So of course, since I've been talking about the past for the last however long, it's always opportune to end with a comment about the future because you need to be glass half full and optimistic. So um, just a couple of final comments, one of which is people love to rip on giant pandas, which is always really depressing. And it's every few years you get a new media story about how pandas are rubbish, how they should be allowed to die out, they should be allowed to die with dignity, we should pull the plug on giant pandas, blah, blah, blah. But if you think about the past, we can kind of think about media friendly issues like this in a different way that yes, giant pandas are now extremely rare. Yes, there's a lot of environmental money goes into giant pandas, but actually, we should actually think of them as survivors that we saw earlier on that central and southern China has lost much 
of its large mammal biodiversity. It's lost the giant muntjacs, it's lost the rhinos, it's lost the elephants. In fact, giant pandas are amongst the few species still to survive there. So we shouldn't think of them as this kind of useless dead end that's a money pit. We should really think, based on what we know from the past, that they're actually kind of the ultimate survivors. How have they managed to last, especially given they're such habitat specialists, when much more generalist species have vanished from those landscapes? So that, to me at least, makes you think we should definitely give them another chance rather than writing them off. But also, if you think about these, the wider data we've talked about, looking at these large scale data sets and these patterns of extinction through time, we can actually see that maybe encouragingly, China's lost few endemic species. We, it's lost the imperial gibbon from the tomb of the grandmother of the first emperor. It's, it's lost a couple of other species, but most species haven't died out entirely. They still survive somewhere to further down in Southeast Asia or wherever. And our attempts to reconstruct these past distributions suggest that most species retain 50% or more of their maximum estimated Holocene distributions. So maybe there is still a potential for successful ecosystem restoration, even in landscapes which are so um, degraded or seem to be a, 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 as, as messed up as much of China's landscapes are. So maybe actually looking at the past gives us a note of hope and encouragement that maybe it's possible to salvage landscapes, even in somewhere like China, which has had such a long history of human pressure. And so maybe ways we could do this would be to look at historical records quantitatively, to look at where species used to occur, what the kind of environmental and habitat parameters associated with those localities, and actually in, in quantify the kind of habitat tolerances and maybe identify suitable sites for reintroduction using these data from the past in a very quantitative way. So here we see that all those dots of where gibbons used to be found in China, and we can convert those into environmental suitability, habitat suitability models, environmental tolerance models. So you can see that actually large areas of China are still suitable for gibbons, at least in terms of climatic parameters, based on where they were in the past. So we can maybe even use these to not only identify suitable reintroduction sites, but also to predict how these species might respond to future environmental change, rather than just looking at the last few pandas stuck upon a few mountains. We'd want to look at what kind of landscapes and the habitats and environments and climates they could withstand based on their past distribution. Maybe that will guide how we might expect them to respond in the future to climate change and the kind of checks and balances we'll need to put in in a management context to ensure that they can survive given the landscapes and habitats we know they can tolerate. So hopefully we can use the past to practically inform the future rather than just talking about it in an academic sense. So one thing I'm really keen to do, for example, is going back to Hainan, we can look at Pear David's deer in terms of the fossil record for China and the archaeological record. We know that from thousands of years ago it was found across much of central and eastern China. And we can use these data to develop habitat suitability models to see whereabouts on Hainan today might be suitable for Pear David's deer, given that we know they were there only 150 years ago. So hopefully in the future, it might be possible to see restored wetland and terrestrial environments informed directly from information from the past, but used to guide management conservation policy in the present and into the future, both for China and elsewhere in the world. So I will end there. I hope that was of interest to anyone and Merry Christmas again. I'd just like to thank the various different donor organisations who funded my work and all of my various collaborators in the UK and China. And I will end with a striking picture of Junza Imperialis, the Imperial Gibbon. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sam, for an absolutely fascinating lecture. We've got lots of questions, so I'm going to try. I'm going to try to kind of dash through them, but um, okay. but if you get tired, just tell me. Okay, I'll sip my cold coffee. <laughs> Darren has asked if the muntjac example could be a rain shift instead of a contract a contraction, and are there fossils in of the same species in the current distribution? The giant muntjac. That's a good question. Um, yes, there. So there actually are. Since we did our study, um paleontologists in Vietnam have found fossils showing that they were present also in the regions they're still present today. So we know that historically or in recent prehistory, they were found not only in southern and central China, but also in Vietnam and Laos as well. So 
and also during that time period there haven't there have been a few little sort of climatic wobbles and ripples but nothing major certainly nothing that you would expect to lead to that level of massive range change and mm. but what we do know of course is that human populations across that region have changed hugely so those fossils those those archaeological remains date from a few thousand years ago when we know that there were humans in China practicing rice agriculture in certain parts of the landscape, but we know there were huge areas of natural habitat left. And the main difference between then and now is that those landscapes have effectively gone, except at really high elevations. So yeah. the most parsimonious explanation is it's, it's human, but we, we can't rule out there could have been some environmental ripples possibly, especially at the northern edge of a range of a tropical adapted species, that the northern edge of the distribution might fluctuate slightly, but you wouldn't expect it to fluctuate that massively. Yeah, that, that, that leads on to, I'm gonna kind of try to skip around in the questions and try to link them together a bit, is, um, is um, there's, there are a couple of questions about population and about rice cultivation. Somebody asked how rice cultivation contributed to air pollution, which I think you were talking about population. And, and what, really was the, what was really the kind of cause behind the population explosion around the middle of the 19th century? Good questions. And I don't know if I'm the absolute best person to, to <laughs> answer them, but um, so the issue with, with rice cultivation is it's something to do with as you're growing rice, it leads to different levels of sort of gas uptake from soil, yeah. I think. And so the, as the sort of vegetation decays and so it's kind of the release of, of the carbon instead of it being fixed in a certain uh, sort of standing plant matter it, it's kind of released the atmosphere when the rice is harvested and mm -hmm. and sort of threshed out I think that's the sort of the very basic beginners climatology 101 explanation so yeah, if you yeah. suddenly convert a landscape from good quality forest or riparian forest and strip that all away and then have the kind of standing carbon being changed every year with a very different porosity to the soil as well mm -hmm. then that will that leads to this sort of shift in how the uh, carbon dioxide and methane is released to the atmosphere across could, this, could the, the spread of paddy of rice also be related to that you know the, the paddy rice growing rice in paddies as a yes that's definitely part of it so it's very different kind of landscape structure in terms of of the soil and, and how how things are trapped in the soil so um so um, a couple of uh, so many questions. I'm going to we're going to try to get through these. Um, is the is the invention um, so were species extinctions in the Pleistocene or Holocene? Is the invention of agriculture when compared to hunter gathering progress or a blunder that affected biodiversity? And is if it's a blunder, could we just say that agriculture also falls into the tra trap of Javon's paradox? These are kind of interesting philosophical points. I know, I thought you might like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess progress is progress. You can't, you can't change it from having happened, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, both from what we can tell about the past, both the advent, the arrival of hunter-gatherer populations in a region and then the change to agriculture in a region as a subsistence yeah. strategy, both of those led mm -hmm. to extinctions. So if we think about how modern humans spread around the world sort of 40, 50,000 years ago, that's associated with a massive wave of biodiversity loss. Although that's typically associated with the loss of the large body megafauna, the largest species. As agriculture yeah. comes in, it's a slightly more complex story because certainly, set, take China as an example, we definitely see extinctions with human arrival there. First, first modern human arrival, mod, our species with its, with its hunted, hunting technology. As agriculture takes hold, we, we see further changes of biodiversity and we see these prehistoric range contractions of some of these large mammals, but we don't really see any further or we see very few species level extinctions, partly because most of the large stuff has already been wiped out and the slightly smaller body species might be a bit more resilient. And especially for, so you can imagine scenarios where even across large areas like China, you could have a relatively sustainable sort of landscape mosaic of a bit of agriculture, a bit of natural forest. It really then depends. So it's not necessarily agriculture per se that's the problem. It's more like how that then 
leads to increasing population growth and there's various different factors which will then be associated with why agriculture in one region is associated with population explosion and not in others all kind of sort of landscape level soil fertility yeah. this and the other so it's a really complex question i mean it's like the ultimate habitat, really it's not all diversity. The same. Yeah, yeah it's kind of basic 20th century which mm -hmm. with its whole extra suite of issues which led to further catastrophic decline Okay, I'm going to try to combine a couple of these here is, is um, there's one question about, um, is there any talk of rewilding, but also there's a question about whether the increasing political tension between China and the West has affected conservation, and, and does this cause difficulty so kind of linking those two things rewilding yeah. and also kind of um, has has political tension had it had an effect on things. It, there's good questions. Um, well, I, so it, it's interesting, actually, because people have been talking about rewilding for recent years and it's, it's a very sort of hot top, trendy fashionable topic to talk about but interestingly China seems to be one of the few instances where pre the last decade or so people have used long-term archive data to guide restoration of mammals and I'm talking here about Pear David's deer which the, the, the backstory for that is, as I said, that it was found surviving in an imperial hunting lodge outside Beijing and a few animals were brought to the west and then the Boxer Rebellion happened and that last herd was killed off around 1900. So all of the, the surviving herd was in was scattered across Europe and then unified in, the, in um, Bedfordshire, in the Duke of Bedford's estate. And from there, animals were brought back to China in, I think, the 80s when sort of political tensions sort of allowed it to open up a bit. And from the 80s onwards, people in China have used the Holocene record, the archaeological record of known localities where Pear David's deer had occurred in the Yangtze Delta thousands of years ago to lead to the establishment of local populations, which are now beginning to be wild and self-sustaining. And so that was done more in a kind of species restoration reintroduction sense. But because it's a large herbivore, it will surely be having some sort of top-down environmental effects on vegetation structure, ecosystem structure and properties. So in a sense, you could think of as China having, whether wittingly or unwittingly, have done one of the first rewilding experiments with Pear David's deer, informed directly by Holocene prehistoric data, which is fascinating to think of it in that sense. It's a kind of actually the only example I've been able to find, irrespective of the fact I work in China. I think that's, it's, it's quite interesting in that sense. Um, in terms of the second part of your question about the sort of, I mean, obviously there's, there's whatever, whatever tensions we're seeing today between East and West, but also it's Unfortunately, that's not a, a new phenomenon throughout the earlier 21st century and throughout the 20, 20th century. It, it's very different cultures, very different histories, very different ways of doing things from the, the daily to the political, very different approaches kind of to everything, which has led to issues with not seeing not being on the same page about things, neither neither is right or wrong, but just having very different understandings about how, how to go about things. So for example, in the work I did with the Yangtze dolphin, it became clear that even think basic concepts like what conservation even is, were understood in very different ways between international stakeholders and stakeholders in China involved with dolphin conservation. Um, whether th things like differentiating between in situ versus ex situ, wild versus captive, how you, how and why and if you even see those as, as, as different and whether you should treat them as different and how, or whether it's fine to think of as uh, animals in a dolphinarium as effectively that's fine, given the, the, the available wild scenarios. So kind of almost any way that people could see things differently has been done in conservation attempts between China and, and the rest of the world, which isn't, isn't necessarily a bad thing because it shows that people think about things in different ways and it can potentially lead to really you know innovative fertile new ideas and directions mm -hmm. but what it has done is led to people it's led to problems when people think that person a is thinking about things in the same way as they are whereas in fact person a and person b aren't on the same step first step in terms of the, what they're talking about that's kind of the thing i've i've i think i've learned the most from working there for so long interesting um uh, Kamal has asked about um, about um, the the 
uh, the questions have all just gone a bit haywire, is um, do you think of DNA storage as zygotes in the same way that we might think of as a seed bank? Is that a potential for conservation of some of these species? So again, a good question. And people have been thinking about this for quite a long time, but um, so I work at the Zoological Society of London. And when I started working there in about 2006 or so, it was the place which curated the, the uh, sort of DNA bank of cell lines and, and sperm and eggs of various different threatened species, um, including I think Pear David's deer actually. So there have been, there are sort of international efforts and protocols to have these kind of frozen tissue lines or, or live cell cultures for threatened species. And I know that that, that has been stepped up a bit in recent years. So the vaquita, the kind of, the Hainan gibbon is one contender for the world's rarest mammal. The vaquita or Gulf of California porpoise is the other one, which has declined catastrophically and it's now down to maybe 13 individuals left because of, of rampant illegal overfishing. And there have been attempts to try and set up an ex situ population which have not worked so far and an animal that was caught and then tragically died they the people working on that did harvest some cells from it just after death so the cells were still alive so there are there is like a living cell line for this critically endangered porpoise species so I know it's kind of more on the table of, of how people are looking at things in conservation these days and I guess coupled with that there are these discussions about de-extinction which again is a complex topic whether it's feasible whether it's not I don't know and it, it's certainly kind of media friendly but whether it's realistic and then the worry is it can maybe distract attention from real conservation is the, is the concern but the idea that maybe if you have a species which has died out recently like the Yangtze dolphin or a thylacine or mouth brooding frogs or things like that if you've got good enough museum material you might be able to reconstruct a genome and um, insert that into an egg of a related species and back breed it back somehow there are these discussions both from the kind of plausible to the to the fabulous about and i'm sure as technology improves these things might become more realistic the, the worry is that the people do often look for a technological fix rather than realizing that unfortunately in the, the day typically it's about human wildlife conflict with poor rural communities who don't have any other resources versus threatened biodiversity and how do you square that circle and getting to the kind of human development human aid or hands dirty trying to physically save rare species in in tricky ecosystems that's the end of the day how it normally works out we're actually looking at ecosystems on the ground and trying to not to destroy them all before it's too late. Yeah. Um, somebody's asked a really interesting question about whether there are any useful records in early legislation and because you know Chinese records go back so far. Are there yeah. any um, legislative or, or administrative records regarding wildlife species from China? So that's really interesting. I know that there's records going back 2000 years of tiger attacks. So people would record if there'd been a lot of tiger attacks recently and therefore if you needed to kind of get hunters in to help get rid of tigers locally. And people have analyzed that to reconstruct or as a sort of metric or index of past tiger abundance across China. Um, I'm not actually sure. I know there could well be though. Um, I know that people, various different things have been recorded. So not just whether a species was there, but also kind of local mythology, local values about them. So often if you look at old gibbon records, there will be, it won't just say there were gibbons in this landscape in, in like X percentage area of forest. It will be sort of like, and, and the gibbons do such and such for people and they're good for local villages. The kind of like a value, poetic or realistic value system associated with them. Um, there could well be legislative stuff in there, especially maybe about things like fisheries actually, or those sorts of resources which might have been used economically. Um, so actually thinking about it, thinking about kind of things that people like Confucius wrote, I know that there, there were values associated with what you were and weren't allowed to do to local environments and forests were supposed to be protected either for Confucian or Taoist reasons but it is actually recorded in local legislature and also uh, even from the kind of 
the Shang and Xia dynasty almost so like the really early dynasties before China was unified there was a kind of establishment of royal hunting lodge so kind of like the deer parks we get in the West, which were very much to allow the, the local kings to kind of practice local hunting and sort of symbolically reenact the relationship between the ruler and the cosmos and the landscape. But they were sort of, hunting was only allowed by certain members of society and there's kind of a lot written about what, what was and wasn't allowed and where and by whom. So. I think there could be interesting avenues to explore if you look in the in the archives about that as well. Great, and we only have about a couple more minutes, so I'm going to try to do my thing of riddling two questions into one, okay. which is really bad because it's quite hard to answer. Is, <laughs> somebody's asked whether the Pear David's deer skins could have been traded to Hainan, so maybe it wasn't native in Hainan. And then, and then there's another question which I think kind of relates to that, which is about um, about the people that you've interviewed and whether or not there, um, how, how, how can you, are there lots of false positives? Okay, good. Um, yeah, interesting questions. So I get, we considered both of these while doing the research. So Hainan has, so nowadays Hainan is kind of being marketed as China's Hawaii and Hugh Grant advertises golf courses there and everything like that. So it's kind of like big news for tourism and you can get direct flights from Manchester. But that, that's kind of a new phenomenon. It was historically always kind of China's sleepy hollow, China's backwater, that people would get exiled there if they'd done something wrong in court. And like four people visited in 400 years that anyone bothered writing about. So it's kind of the really, historically, the really rural hick corner of China. And so we know there were tributes from Hainan to mainland China, to the imperial court, from what records tell us. But there's very little evidence of anything going back in the direction. It was kind of like a vassal state on the edge of the empire, which people sucked resources into the centre of the empire from, rather than stuff going back. So you can't rule out that someone would have put deer there but it's really hard to imagine why they would have done because there was kind of no one there of any importance at least as it was seen in imperial times it was where you got sent to if you'd done something bad rather than you wanting to have a nice deer which was so important you'd have it in the imperial hunting lodge so that's kind of it's not definite but it's it, it's very unlikely anything would have gone in that direction i think the one thing we do know i think we know that elephants were traded from vietnam through hainan up to imperial china but again there's like that, that wasn't released into the wild and also we know that these deer individuals were actually shot somewhere in the mountains of central hainan so it wasn't from a kind of deer park it was from somewhere in the forests in the in the wilderness um the other question was about um, whether talking to people, whether you'd get false positives. And yet, yeah, so the issue of talking to local people, this is, it's really fascinating to do. And it's also something which a lot of biologists kind of approach with trepidation, because not only do you need to know the whole biological environmental context, but you've got to have a really good grounding in kind of socioeconomics and local anthropology and culture and all of those really interesting nuanced ways of doing things. You've got to know what, how people in that culture might approach a certain question, what their values are and everything like that. Um, what you can do and what we, what we do in these cases is first of all, you would show them a picture. You might show them a picture of the animal, ask them to name what it is so to demonstrate they actually know it and provide a bit of information or give a local name and ask them to explain what the animal looks like. So you can sort of verify awareness of what that animal concept is but then also you can combine that with false with, with a, a positive control and a negative control in the same questionnaire so you could have something like a giant anteater which you know doesn't live in that landscape mm -hmm. but also is kind of very you, they couldn't confuse it with an animal that might live there right. and then a positive control animal like a wild boar which you know is still in those forests and then you can sort of filter out anyone that says they've seen a giant anteater you can then exclude the data they've provided because mm -hmm. it might have been an innocent mistake or they might have been just wanting to say yes to everything yeah that so, often happens the yes yeah. to everything bit yeah and then even just structuring the question so it's not a simple yes or no so the person you're talking to doesn't necessarily have a sense as to what you might want to know you wouldn't have a, a, a sort of neutral and guarded a questioning approach as possible but that's a really good question because mm -hmm. you've got to have so much sort of checks and balances to to try to filter out any of those sort of unwanted positives yeah. 
Well, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to ask, I just want to, I want to thank you about this, but I'm just going to ask one last question, which I know we're going to answer in the same way is are all species valuable or are there examples we, we might not want ticks or rats, for example? Well, all biodiversity is valuable, but Absolutely. Maybe you could say <laughs> from an evolutionary perspective, maybe some species are more equal than others. If you've got a Selenodon or an Echidna versus a species with oh, but common ones are important too, Sam. All, we can have this debate. We can, we can, <laughs> we can this debate later. Sam, thank you so much for an absolutely fascinating lecture. I don't know if you've been watching the chat, but people have been saying thank you so much for a brilliant lecture. This is amazing. You know, this is great. It's just so fantastic. And I think what you've showed us is how important it is to not only look to the present and the future, but also look in the past, but always think about the past in balance and, and thinking about all those things together. So thanks so much for the kind of really fantastic Christmas lecture. And I also just want to thank one last time the staff of the society for being so amazing over this really difficult COVID year. And you've ended the year with a bang saying. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and it's been really nice to, to contribute to the Linnaean lecture series. So excellent. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Good night.